for making your way to this fine establishment with the traffic that was happen happening outside. How many of you got caught in that mess? Probably a few, sorry about that, but it'll, it'll be worth your while, promise. So there's a few things that I wanna uh, share with you before we get going tonight. So for those of you interested in nominating your bestest buddy in the business world, Sage nominations close this Thursday. And I hear that we have, what, 30? plus nominations so far. So if you know of a business out there who really needs some recognition, doing great things in the community, be sure and nominate them for this award. Uh, the next thing is to talk a little bit about the Bend Young Professionals. Is anybody here tonight from Bend YP? Yeah? Yay! So the young professionals, a couple of things you need to know about. There's events and development labs and uh, supportive, great interactive uh, events for them that go on uh, all year long. If you are an employer, you want your employees to go to this because they learn about um, how to develop career skills, they learn about how to get involved in community, and they learn about how much they love working for your company because you support them in going to that and in September is the Bend YP Summit. And we are looking for sponsors for the summit, uh, but most of all, we're looking for you to encourage your young professionals that work for you to attend. It's a great event. Uh, they learn a lot. It's a full day of, of personal and, and career development, and um, definitely we're sending your employees to. Let's see, and next up, Wednesday, June 19th, so that's next week. We have a mixer at Payne West. Yay, Vic Martinez is here from Payne West over there. So it's a free event for all Ben Chamber members, food, drink, music, and, and um, a great chamber member. So we thank you for that. And then next month, the Wet's Brewing is the state of the county. So we'll have the county commission here. We'll be talking about what's going on with their legislative work on housing, on new judge, judges for um, Chutes County, for um, uh, the new waste management uh, facility that we need to replace because they're running out of space. All sorts of great things they'll be talking about next month. And then August, everybody go on vacation because we are not having a what's brewing. <laughs> I will, if you will. So I think that is all the announcements. Let me double check here. So just one last thing, all this takes a lot of time and effort. If you are um, not a Bend m Chamber member, encourage you to, to help support us so we can pull these things off and support our business community and the people that work for them. So with that, I'm gonna introduce tonight's co-moderator. Jeff Kitchens works for BLM. He is the guy who hires the folks that go out and protect our community from fires. And he's also the chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, Committee for the city. And he's a great guy, and I've been able to work with him on a couple of things. And he's agreed to help me co-moderate tonight. So we want to welcome Jeff Kitchens. Thank you. OK, so we're going to get started and uh, learn who these wonderful people up here are. Um, so what I've asked them to do is tell us who they are. I've asked them to tell us where they work, and I've also asked them to tell us the one word they would describe their workplace. And we'll start with you, Derek. Uh, so yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Derek Koops. I'm the general manager of the Thermo Fisher site across the street. Uh, and a word to describe the work environment there, I would go with intense. <laughs> but in a good way. <laughs> I'm uh, Jared Narlock. I'm a senior organizational development consultant at St. Charles Healthcare, and uh, this the word was easy, passion. Hi, I'm Marcus Legrand, and I'm the Career Pathway and Success Coach at uh, COCZ, or Central Oregon Community College. And let me see, one word, complex. And I'm Katie Anderson. I'm the CEO at Aperion Management Group, and... Um, my cheering squad in the front here. <laughs> uh, and one word, that's really hard. We are a lot of things, but I would say that we are rethinkers. Does anybody know why I asked them to use the one word? Does anybody? So if you read a lot of business books and leadership books, they will tell you that you should be able to describe your company and the office space in which you work in the time it takes you to go from one floor to the next in an elevator. 
So if you can get your elevator speech on to like a sentence or less, you're rocking it. All right, so uh, without further ado, we're going to kind of jump into this and learn a little bit more about their experiences and what they've been able to kind of do in terms of recruiting and retention of folks here in Central Oregon. So Katie, if you're right, I'm going to go ahead and start off with you. And so what I'd like to hear uh, from you is to tell us a little bit about how your company attracts and retains talents. Yeah, so um, we saw sort of a tight labor market emerging about two years ago um, when the way that people were applying for jobs, the way that people were interacting with us was beginning to shift. Uh, we were seeing less applicants, we were seeing uh, a change in the qualifications for applicants, and um, the ease at which we were used to sort of bringing people into our organization at somewhat of a moment's notice, we have a need coming in a couple of weeks or a month, um, was starting to shift. And so two years ago, we sat down with our senior team and really, um, understood that we're a people business. I believe most businesses are people businesses, but we're really a service-based business that can't grow without our people. The core of our business is, is our staff. And so we needed to really understand how we were gonna continue to grow that team so we could continue to grow our business. And um, so with that sort of emerging and changing trend, we, being rethinkers, decided we got to look at this from another angle. Um, it's not as simple as putting out an ad or where we're posting the ad. Um, it, it's going to come down to who we are as a company. And so it sounds um, a bit simplistic, but it really started with our culture and, and that elevator speech and making sure that we could truly at our core understand who we were as a company because we couldn't attract the talent to our company if we didn't know who we were and who they were coming to work for. Um, and there are a lot of amazing businesses here in Central Oregon, and uh, in some senses, we're competing for that same talent pool, but if you distinctly know who you are, you know who your culture is, and you are approaching it from that perspective, we found that we aligned with the right applicants. So we started ultimately with our culture and really trying to define some sort of core values and attributes that we were about. And then we made sure that our recruitment process lined up with that culture. Um, I don't know about many of you, but early in my career, you would submit a resume, you would get a call from a hiring manager, they would do sort of a pre-interview with you, you might go in for a one-on-one -on -one interview with that lead department, then you might go to a panel interview, and then you'd be either given a job offer or, so sorry, we went with another candidate. That was a typical hiring process. That didn't match our company. Um, when we reevaluate our culture, we wanted to be a fun people organization that people wanted to work at, that was a fun environment. We have a tough job. Most of our managers sort of function as a complaint department. We manage homeowners associations for a living. So they don't call us to tell us that we hope you have a great day. They're functioning as a complaint department. So we had to offset that hard environment. And so we made sure that our hiring process matched up to the culture that was fundamental to our company. And that went from, we changed our application process. Our application is a set of really fun questions um, that tell us a lot about someone's personality. Funny things like, if we gave you an elephant, what would you do with it? Um, are you a morning person? <laughs> what kind of coffee do you drink? Do you like coffee? Do you like chocolate? Things that on the face of it seem somewhat silly, but they match who we are as a company. Uh, and we changed the hiring and interviewing process that married up with who we were as a company. So now when we're recruiting a manager, they get a call from another manager to go out and have a more social interaction, have coffee, have lunch, um, get to know who our company is and make sure that they want to come on board with us. So for us, what we found through that recruitment process is it was important to define our culture. It was important that our process married that culture and that we, through that process, made sure that it was really consistent. Um, we also don't start new staff on Mondays. We start them on Fridays. Um, we play funny games when new staff comes into the office. So they don't like get their computer logins or any of those things for a while. Um, so. Whatever your company culture is, I think you have to decide how that process looks based off of who you are as a company. And it's gonna be different for every single one of our companies, but at the core, um, 
our, we found that that employment environment was changing and we had to be willing to sort of tip our process on its head and be willing to examine any of the elements that we thought might have been working. Thank you. Marcus, I'm gonna turn to you next. Uh, same questions. Tell us about your company uh, in terms of attracting and retaining talent. Um, one, I'm not a recruiter by any means. But in my current position, what I do a lot of is I really help students try to find out what companies want. That's the key thing I do a lot of, trying to figure out exactly what these students need to do in order to be a part of your organizations. So I try to help them navigate that and dig deep. Now, based on what, working at the school now, there's a lot of things we uh, do well. We have a hiring committee that really gets together and work in order to try to find the right candidate, if it's internal or external, because I've been on a few hiring committees, so I have an understanding of what we do there. And we always try to figure out who they are as a person, but also what they can bring to the organization. And as we continue to do that, we are finding that there's a lot of diamonds in the rough we didn't even know about. Also, we look at students who have also attended the school in the past and stated, okay, if you've gone off and come back, we look at maybe hopefully bringing some of those people back because they've had the opportunity to be able to do things. Now, the one thing I love more than anything about working at the, the school is we're very collaborative in the sense that we all are from different departments are working together to make it happen. We just don't say HR is gonna do it. Uh, English department, someone in uh, human, uh, excuse me, in uh, social sciences, someone from student services. Even sometimes a student will be on the committee because you're getting the breadth of people being able to work on the committees to make that happen, all right? So we do a lot of things to try to make sure that we have the right people. And we also get to vet those people a little bit more because sometimes we just ask, do anybody know of these people or have they had any interaction with them? So it allows us to be able to do the necessary things to get the right person. But back to the students. The students that I work with a lot of times are looking for an employer who will allow them to have the flexibility and the ability to be able to have their ideas heard. So that's what I'm trying to train students to do when they're out here in the workforce. So a lot of you in the room, if you see some of my students coming to your companies, understand that I've hopefully have given them insight on what they need to do. So that's where we're at. Thank you. Jared? Yeah, both, uh, you know, some similar aspects that Katie and Marcus said. And I got to join St. Charles about a year ago because uh, they were really looking to take a, a shift in this process knowing the, the changing landscape of healthcare. And uh, the, the attraction piece is a little bit easier in healthcare because of the, you know, the dedicated focus of, of one, the healthcare landscape, and then two, the location, which the location in Bend, that's a, a easy attraction point. But the retention is where the, the challenge and the, the transition in our culture has taken place. And a lot of uh, similar aspects of what Katie said. And so, in the actual um, attraction for new hires, it's looking at how do we actually ensure that this is the right partnership? Uh, how does this person embody our values, but also how do we show that we're embodying that for them? So they're coming into an environment where they know we allow the, the ability to have those questions and they're empowered to bring that forward because we wanna be in a, a culture of continuous improvement where people are bringing their best, their best selves, they're excited about that, and what that entails. And so uh, very similar to what Katie said, their, their first day is not you know, what a lot of us have experienced about the technical side. You gotta do this and you get your logins and you go through compliance and regulatory things. It is more about them discovering how they connect to the purpose. So they've already heard it. Purpose of St. Charles, you know, our vision is creating America's healthiest community together. And the understanding that for a healthcare organization, lots of times people think about the physical well-being. But we're also talking about the mental well-being, and that includes, you know, the culture of caregivers that we have. And it's, it's such a transition when somebody sees that vision, and it's just not words on a piece of paper to them, but they're finding out on day one, how do they actually connect? And so they go through that process of exploring what do those mean, words mean to them and their why. And so an example I'll give is, is my why in life is to help others grow and develop and inspire them to take action on where they wanna go, what they wanna do. And that connects for me in multiple ways in that vision. And I was able to you know, take that and do that just as any of our new caregivers are. And then that continues 
in that already established partnership where we have a lot of peer interviewing. So they know their team members, some of them that they're coming on board with, with their leaders. And it's a, a process of, you know, how do we make this successful? And that onboarding experience goes well beyond that first day into the first year and continuation of that. And so uh, with that, that first day experience leads into how are we engaging them? What does it look like? And that's a, a wonderful opportunity that St. Charles has taken to, to focus on from a professional leadership development standpoint. So how are we growing our leaders to look for those uniquenesses in the employees that they're leading and really meet them where they're at, giving them an opportunity to grow and develop in unique ways because it's, it's a, a different environment when you have a bedside nurse that's working 12 hours a day that has to be by that bedside. How do you engage them in a different way? And uh, as uh, Marcus brought up, a lot of individuals coming into the workforce, regardless of industry, they're looking for the flexibility. They're looking for the flexibility in the hours that are worked and the way that work gets done. And so uh, in the areas that we can do that, a lot of our support services, it's giving them a flexible work schedule and more empowerment to say, you know, here's what needs to get done, how you do that and the hours that you do that in. We wanna provide some flexibility on where that works and how you grow in that perspective and regard. And uh, working with our leaders doing that, our caregivers offering the opportunities uh, from a retention standpoint. And then continuing to work to create an environment that has strong roots in it as well. That's a really big thing. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with engagement surveys. You know, it's a, a buzzword, but so many of those engagement surveys are anonymous. And uh, while yes, your environment may start out that way, what we're working towards is in the next few years, we don't need it to be anonymous because we have that, that back and forth dialogue, you know, rooted in strong trust. And we bring people in with that vision set. And so those that are coming in right now are excited to see it, but where that rub is, is some of those that have been there and uh, haven't seen that before. And we have a long history at St. Charles. And so um, keeping the innovation going on how we get there from an engagement standpoint to uh, continue to build those roots and uh, retain those people long-term. Thank you. Uh, Derek, do you want to show us your presentation, yeah, talk a so, little bit about the questions? Yeah, perfect. So I'm going to answer this uh, two part. First of all, I'm going to talk about the company. And then second, I'll talk about the talent and how we attract the team. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to really take advantage of having a captive audience. I've been living here now for about nine months, and when I meet parents at school or when I meet you know, the taxi driver, no one's ever heard of them or for sure scientific and doesn't know we're here or what we do. So I thought I'd take advantage of your attention for a few minutes. Um, oh, I forgot there was, sorry. Forgot there was some animation on there. Uh, okay, so Thermo Fisher Scientific. So we, we're, we're growing in, the, in the, uh, the Bend location. Thermo Fisher is a massive company, about 70,000 employees, uh, 25 billion in revenue. We're a really tiny piece of that. We've, we're up to now 100 people at the site. Uh, and basically what we do, we don't make any commercial products you could buy at a pharmacy. We develop new products. Uh, so we make tablets and capsules for clinical trials to bring new products to market. Uh, so the, the niche technology that we have at the site is to improve the solubility of the uh, active ingredient. So if there's a product that might have failed in the clinic because not enough of the active got to the subject, then we can help uh, with some tricks of the trade to improve that. So it's kind of uh, who we are and what we do. We're actually just located across the street from where we are now uh, on the other side of 18th. So that's a public service announcement about uh, Thermo Fisher. Uh, so, so uh, switching gears now to talk about the talent uh, and how we attract and retain talent. So we have pretty standard pipelines in terms of how we get interest uh, of talent in the site. Uh, we're a large uh, Fortune 500 company, which certainly helps. Um, we can take advantage of the recruiting through Thermo Fisher. Uh, we actually get a lot of referrals of employees coming into the site through em employees uh, that refer their friends to the site, which has been a great source for us. I want to keep that going. Uh, we, we try to work on our visibility in the community, so we put a lot of energy into participating in STEM events like this, bio in the high desert, to try and get our visibility up, uh, which helps. Uh, and then we also use some of the more standard um, pipelines through the educational routes, through partnerships with uh, OSU, uh, Cascades, COCC, uh, the, the various educational institutes in the, uh, in the area. So that gives us kind of the talent pool, which we can kind of cut into four different uh, sections. Um, so if I look at the roughly 100 people that we have at the site, 
Uh, we've actually been growing fairly substantially. I started in September, we had 80, we're up to 100, and we're, we're, we want to keep growing in the future. So we need to make sure that we're not losing all of our talent that we bring in uh, with a lot of turnover. So uh, when, I, when I look at the, and I guess partly why I'm so worried about turnover is when I look at the cut of where our employees came from, about a third of our employees uh, have come to us fresh out of school. We've got about a third that came from non-pharma industry, and then about a little bit more than a third, whoops, 40% uh, or so that came from uh, um, the pharma industry, not, not within our network. And we actually only have two people at the site that came from Thermo Fisher, but not from, from the site. So uh, with such a large percentage of people working in their first job uh, and, and coming out of school, there's, there's obviously a concern about turnover. So we want to make sure that we're providing a lot of development and challenges uh, in order to retain the, the staff that we bring in. So, so rather than me really going on and, and talking about what we've done to make this uh, a work environment with some opportunities, I actually wanted to share with you one of our rising uh, talents in the, in the site who happens to be born and raised in, in Oregon. So she's really a success story, born and raised here, went away to school, came back, uh, found a job locally, and then has been working with us for the last seven years. So I could introduce Brenda Sturphy to talk about her experience as an employee. Oh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Do you want to hit the one more slide? Oh, yes, right. Derek made a nice slide on my career for me, so thanks, Derek. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm born and raised here in Central Oregon, actually third generation. So my grandfather graduated from Redmond Union High, which is Redmond City Hall now. Um, go Panthers. Wasn't Panthers back then. But I uh, went away to Oregon State University in Corvallis. I got my Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and came back home for the summer. Um, I wanted a job because, one, I wanted to make money to pay off my ever-growing student, um, <laughs> student debt, um, but I also wanted to get my foot in the industry and, and start my career. So I called upon a gear, which was in Derek's second slide, and that was a pharmaceutical company established in 2007. Um, it's actually a spinoff of Bend Research, um, and I came in as a quality control laboratory intern. So to talk about why I was drawn to the company at that time was one, that they were willing to give me the time of day, essentially. I was 19. I had no experience. I was a freshman in college. And they brought me in and they interviewed me with five people and leadership. And they invested time in me. And they invested money. They were willing to pay me for my work, pay me to wash their glassware before we had a glassware dishwasher. Um, and so that was really important. And that's what drew me in. So why did I keep coming back? I came back again as a quality control intern, and then I came into corporate development, and then I went and actually was a manufacturing intern and worked in the operations before getting hired on full-time after college. So I continued to come back, not only because of that first initial investment, but because the company continued to allow me to grow and continued to invest time and opportunities into me. Um, I had a lot of great mentors and relationships that I was able to build there. Um, and just a lot of support. I feel like the company, as I was growing up, and as the company was growing up, really, um, there was a belief in taking care of your employees first, and that the, your employees would take care of you, and, your, and you would have that continued growth, um, which I think still exists. So that's why I wanted to keep coming back. Um, so why do I continue to feel fulfilled? I was hired on in QA, which is the re regulatory piece after college. I've since moved into project coordination and now I'm a project manager. Um, really, it's that I wanted to stay in Central Oregon for the reasons I already discussed with the family and, and history here, but I still feel like I have a lot of growth opportunities. I don't ever feel like I'm blocked into my career. I feel like my responsibilities and um, my role changes as the company changes and I don't feel like it's a dead end. Um, and along with that, we have a lot of training and development programs that the company prioritizes. Uh, which I don't think is just unique to a 70,000 person company. You could do it at a small startup too. It's one really great example is uh, mid-year and, and year-end reviews where I sit down with my managers and I talk about development goals and development opportunities and reach goals outside of my current responsibilities and how do I get to the next step? It's formalized. Um, so I guess the key takeaway that why I came and why I've stayed and why I continue to stay is the investment of time, effort, um, and and the investment of training and, and diverse opportunities and, and giving me chances like to come here and, and talk today. So that really rounds it all out. Thank you. That was 
Awesome. Um, we're going to have one more person come up and speak. Oscar, will you join me up here for a moment? Um, so Oscar Gonzalez is here tonight from the Latino Association. And I asked him to give us a little bit of the perspectives uh, that the Latino Association uses in supporting some of the networks in the communities that they work with in terms of finding careers, finding work, et cetera. So I'm going to ask Oscar to share some thoughts with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Oscar Gonzalez. I'm the Programs Manager for the Latino Community Association of Central Oregon. And for those of you who may not be aware as to who we are, we're a local nonprofit. Um, our main base is here in Bend, but we have offices in Redmond, Madras, and Primeville. We're primarily a service delivery organization. Um, and whatever walks in through the door, we are there to serve primarily our immigrant population, our Spanish speakers, um, which is challenging uh, in this particular uh, political uh, background that we're uh, currently living in. Um, it's, as a, as a past educator, it's really pleasing to hear uh, because I know back in the past, it was about conforming students to the system. And now we've learned to meet students, um, and Marcus and I think Jared had mentioned that, meeting um, students where they're at. And so I would say the same thing as a challenge to y'all who um, may consider um, diversifying your workforce, and even um, inviting and being uh, uh, in, um, welcoming to other folks who may not um, quite be there in terms of their status or language or skill development. And I'm talking about people like my parents who came here a long time ago, but someone gave, someone gave them a chance to move along social economically so that we, as their children, could then benefit educationally by you know, sticking to the grind and taking care of business and staying out of trouble, becoming degreed, becoming credentialed. And so I guess what my, our challenge is is the fact is baby boomers, um, including myself, are retiring um, every day. And by 2035, there's going to be a huge gap in terms of employment needs. And that's where immigrant population comes into play, where they uh, prognosticate that 70 to 80 percent of all future employees um, by 2040 are going to be of some type of immigrant background. And I'm just curious, amongst this crowd, how many of you um, are immigrants yourself? Or how many of y'all come from families who immigrated to this country from somewhere else in the United States? Raise your hand. That's a lot of us. And see, and that's what's happening now. And not so much for economic reasons, but more reasons out of desperation. So I think it precludes us as employers, as service delivery organizations, um, in, in all aspects, education, obviously, to be embracing, to be inclusive, to give people opportunities uh, in spite of, again, their situation. And my point is that it's, it's, it's going to become more of a dire necessity if we want our economy to sustain the levels of productivity that we have come to, come to live by and accept. So um, we, beyond working with folks, helping them acquire English, helping them to become legal residents, helping them to become legal um, US, permanent, uh, or excuse me, U.S. citizens, helping folks to um, not only get a job, but get a better job, uh, helping them develop a resume for the first time. And for folks who have never seen themselves on a, on a piece of paper, it is so tremendously powerful. <laughs> and for, my, for ourselves, the key is beyond working with the parents, but as using the parents as models for their children so that their children will follow suit and work towards realizing the American dream that I believe is still attainable. It's harder now. A lot of us brown folks and, and others feel like we got a target on our back for different reasons, and I'm sure y'all who keep up with what's happening right now know what I'm talking about. But this will pass, <laughs> and uh, whether or not the wall gets built or not, guess what? We're here, <laughs> and we're not going back. <laughs> so let's make the most of it and truly be as embracing 
and meeting people where they're at instead of trying to get them to conform to our own values. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to jump into an exercise in one moment, but I, I just wanted to share something that I think is important given all the perspectives and everything you've heard here. So to talk a little bit, and I'm going to give you just a brief little overview. I've had the opportunity to work in hiring and recruiting all over the United States, uh, from towns as small as less than 600 people to cities like Miami and uh, here in Bend, um, places in Denver, Lakewood, Arvada area. And so one of the lessons that I've learned that I wanted to share, and, and I think uh, Oscar kind of hit the nail on the head on this one, is that there are a lot of opportunities out there to look for candidates that we don't usually think about. Organizations and nonprofits that provide resources to us. Uh, to prepare for tonight, one of the folks I talked to was Seth Johnson with Opportunity Foundation. I've also gone into presentations and heard from folks at Abilitry. So we have resources in our community that help us with folks that need access or accommodations and can provide, you know, really wonderful uh, candidates for our applicant pools. We have organizations like the Latino Association. We have a whole host of avenues. There are associations and organizations that support veterans to provide work that brings them back into the workforce. It's something in the federal government we're really big about, and it's been an awesome opportunity to find incredible talent and bring those folks into the workforce. So when you think about where you're hiring and how you're hiring, whether it's through Monster, through local boards, through word of mouth, through networking, or whatever, one of the things I want to challenge you with before you, as you walk out of here tonight is thinking about what we're doing, thinking about bringing that culture to you. Think about being outside the box as well. I'll turn it over to you, Katie. Thanks, Jeff. That was really great. Thank you, panel, and to those of you in the audience. That was a really great presentation. And what we're going to do tonight is have a little interaction. You guys get to participate. Um, some of you have been here when we've used Menti before. So if you will pull out your mobile device, go to www.menti.com, and there's the code. You punch in that code, and it's going to take you to a survey. We're going to do real-time feedback here. And we're going to use this to have some dialogue and uh, get a little perspective. And sorry, these are a little, I'm going to read these out loud. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask you the question. We're going to put it up on the wall, on the screen. And then Jeff's going to interact with the panel a little bit on what their perception is. And I may call on a few folks in the audience to give a little feedback as we go forward. So can everybody read this on their phones? Salary, company values align with yours, flexibility and lifestyle, diversity and inclusiveness, accessibility, I feel listened to and valued. What is the most important to you in attracting you to a job? There are several clear winners here. OK. So it looks like, so far, the flexibility and lifestyle, no big surprise. Look outside. Yep. So um, and we know that that attracts a lot of folks to uh, Central Oregon and Bend specifically. Company values align. That's pretty strong. And also. I feel listened to and valued. Top three. Interesting. Salary is only 7%. So, Jeff, do you want to ask the panel to react to this data? What do they think? Yeah, so let's, um, well, let's just go with the big one. That's always fun. Let's talk a little bit about flexibility and lifestyle. So in my world, we call this the work-life balance. We create that opportunity for folks to have a flexible work schedule whatever that is, and wherever they are in the world. And it's, we think about things like family first. We think about the opportunities for them to have alternate work schedules. We think about them to have co-work schedules. There's a whole bunch of things. So I'm curious if one of the panel members would like to jump in. Um, why don't we start with you, Marcus? I'm going to jump in with you first. Can you talk a little bit about your perspectives? And you, you touched on this before when you were talking about coaching your students. So maybe give us a little bit more in terms of details of when you're coaching students, what you're hearing back from them in terms of this flexibility and lifestyle. A lot of times when I'm talking to my students, the thing I'm hearing most is that they need child care, which is not a lot of child care here. They need affordable housing, which is not a lot of affordable housing here. So that makes them have to move or do something else. So I have to be able to be nimble enough to be able to go to them. 
be able to find out where they're at and try to help them. So it happens all the time. Most of my appointments, I would love to have them in the morning, but most of them have to work. And then also I'm dealing with a lot of students who are one, not finished their degree, some have not finished their GEDs. So imagine a person who doesn't have a GED and right now we're to a point where we're almost, everything's gonna be automated. So how do you get their skill set to be here and to being able to do those things and then find a company who's willing to be able to work with them on a, on a daily basis and be able to get things done? It's really, really hard. So things I'm trying to teach them is how to navigate systems. How do they work? How do you be able to inject yourself into those systems and see where you fit? So that's what I'm always trying to help them with so they understand that they can be well-rounded, not only in their job, but at home as well. Derek, can you talk to us a little bit about how your company kind of looks at flexibility and lifestyle? And, and you mentioned this again a little bit in your presentation as well, but maybe flesh that out for a little, a little bit. Things that you do to try to support this for your employees. So you, you say Jared or Derek? Derek. Derek, Sorry. okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, actually, I would say that's probably not the biggest strength that we have. I think if there's something that we would want to work on to improve the flexibility, that's probably it. I think we try to be sensitive, treat each other like people, you know, people have things to do with their kids, like we, we're understanding, but we don't have a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of shifts. Um, so I would say probably that's an opportunity where we could expand on that. We do give opportunities for new roles for people, which I guess gives some flexibility, but yeah, certainly something I think we could work on. Katie, you want to give us some thoughts on this? You, you had some great things you shared before in your presentation. Yeah, so, I mean, we can't attract talent to Central Oregon to live a lifestyle that we then don't let them live. Um, and I really, I dislike the word balance. Sorry, I will pick on you for just a second because balance implies something that is attainable or that you can achieve, and there's always a give and take. Um, there are times where my family demands a lot more from me than I'm able to give to my work. And so there are times where my work really needs my focus and my family gets a little less of it. So we like to use the word harmony um, in our office because it's something that has a little bit more flexibility to it. But I think um, for us, family and sort of a lifestyle were the reasons I founded my company. I left a company that was an environment that was not workable for me to be a new mom with a brand new baby. I had executives who expected something of me that I couldn't give and be a mom. And so we wanted to create a company, uh, you know, me and my two business partners, we wanted to create a company that allowed other people to come into it and have that same lifestyle, which meant there are weeks that I work 60 hours, there are weeks when I work 20. And you know, I wanna believe that both sides of my life are better for what we have created and provided. But I think as employers, we have to know what our employees need, which means get to know them. Uh, every single one of your employees is gonna need something different or they're going through something and they might need support from you. So family and lifestyle doesn't mean that we give them a powder day. That, that doesn't incorporate that. It's that we know them, we give them the flexibility when they need time off to take care of their family. Our staff jumps in and helps support them. It's not just the executives within our company that are living that, it's our whole culture that's living that. So if you wanna say that you are promoting lifestyle and family, you have to figure out how you're living it through your culture. Awesome, Jared? Yeah, this is, uh you know, one of the biggest things, and I'm, I'm glad uh, Kitty uh, spoke there because she is doing what, what is happening out there. If you look at best places to work, I, ha I had the opportunity to go to DC and look at 50 best places to work, and this was one of the number, well it was, it was the top area for all those places and the fact that there was flexibility. And almost every single one of them were exactly what Katie has done. They were individuals that were in a environment that the walls were were set this is the way it is we can't do that and people in the environment today have the opportunity they they have you know the access to so much answers and knowledge of, of how to go out and do it on their own and say we're going to create the environment then you said you haven't we're going to create it and we'll see what happens and they're becoming very successful because they're open to the innovation and saying how do we make this where it is flexible and and i love that you you mentioned the word balance as well uh, there's a great book called Conscious Business by uh, MIT professor Fred Kaufman, and he actually calls out that, that term 
it's become very popular and it's out there and used a lot, work-life balance, but he said, you know, for the, the generation that's coming in, it's all life. And they're looking at that and, and saying, yes, I'm willing to put the 60 hours in this week, and then next week I've got this going on and I'm gonna do the 20 hours. And so, like I, I, I mentioned initially with healthcare, that, that's a difficult piece to, uh, to attract people, not necessarily to the organization, but to the career field, because it, it is a career field that right now, the way that it's done, uh, it's done you know, a particular way that it is more of a traditional. And so healthcare is looking as a whole to say, how do we become more innovative and again, to meet people at their healthcare needs where they're at, and uh, and in order in turn to to uh, meet the the employees and the workforce coming in where they want to go, which is that flexibility, because you know the 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 money piece, you know those days I think are gone because people have said you know that's not fixing what I want. It's here. It's short term, and uh, I want to be able to uh, to be able to get it done, to be empowered to get it done in a unique way and to be in an environment that's ever changing, knowing that there's gonna be more changes coming. Got a question for everybody in the audience. Of this flexibility, how many is it the women employees versus the male employees? Think about that for a second. It's most of the women have to be flexible, not the men. Think about that for to a certain extent. Not in our company. Yeah. <laughs> not to a certain extent. It's the woman has to be flexible and still be able to get, get the pay and get everything that they're doing as well. So think about that as well when you're looking at those things too. I have a wife, she's a doctor, so guess who has to be flexible? <laughs> but I'll have a problem with that, you know why? Because I know I'm supporting her needs to be able to get the things done that she needs to get done. So when you're thinking about those things too, think about those equitable things as well. But as employers too, I would say, um, ask yourself why not? Yeah. I mean, if you have an employee that's coming to you and saying, hey, I have this challenge and I'd like to do X, before you say no, ask yourself, why not? It, it will change your perspective on how you are interacting with your team and the company that you are creating. Because if you continue to throw up those walls and live within those boxes, your staff's not gonna wanna stay. And we have pretty low retention because we're willing to constantly think outside that box. For low, sorry, low high, turnover. high retention, yeah. <laughs> low turnover. <laughs> Great. I want to turn to the audience. Mm -hmm. Who uh, who was part of the forty three percent? Does anybody want to volunteer to unpack and share a little bit of why you voted for a lifestyle and flexibility? Anybody out there? I'm gonna pick somebody. If you don't pick yourself, all right. Uh, I moved back to Bend after getting my bachelor's degree because of the lifestyle that existed here. So I actually work for the Bend Chamber. <laughs> uh, and it is one of my favorite perks about working there. Um, I know that if there's something I really want to do or something I really need to be taken care of, all I need to go is, do is go to my leadership team and they're going to they're gonna hear me out. <laughs> oh, okay. We're going to go to Debbie next. Hi, um, I'm retired. I worked for IBM for 19 years. I did not have a lot of flexibility. So if I look back on my career, I look at, back on the time with my family and all the rest of it, I made a lot of money. I got my kids through college, all, that's all good. But there's a lot I missed out on. So flexibility and lifestyle, that's why we're here. In retirement, unfortunately, Maybe we should have done it sooner. <laughs> yeah, great. Another person. If you could share your name, that would be great. Hi, Cindy DeSoto. I actually did not pick flexibility as my issue, but I have a suggestion. Um, I've lived in Bend now five years from Seattle, and one of the things as a cons customer here is the businesses roll up at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Like, it's a very Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 universe here. And I think one of the really easy ways to create flexibility is to just, you know, open later and split your shifts, you know, and let people choose if they're morning people, night people, because the customer here is willing to do business outside of Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. So just a thought. Right. Lots more. Here you go. So I work for Katie with <laughs> Aperion Management Group, and I will just be a testament to the fact that it is a real thing. Um, when I interviewed with Katie, I had told her that I'd worked my way up very, very high at a bigger company. 
um, to the job that I thought I wanted that paid me a lot of money and had more employees and more clients than even the company I work for now under just me. And I said, I don't want anything to do with this industry anymore if you don't give me some flexibility to take care of my family, to get my job done the way I need to do it. I've got some experience. You need to trust me that I'm going to handle it. And I was honestly kind of shocked that it was like, yeah, that's a thing here and we can do that. And um, it works. And I'm grateful that there are companies here in town that are making the Ben lifestyle a reality for some of those um, company culture flexibility uh, initiatives. One more, and then we're going to move on. Hi, I'm Kelly. Um, I work in healthcare. I work at St. Charles, and I'm a nurse. Um, but I wasn't always a nurse. In raising my kids, um, there wasn't the flexibility to leave when your child was sick. There wasn't the um, you weren't covered by the Family Act if you had a sick child at home. And now all my peers that I work with, if someone's sick, they're like, you're out of here, we got you covered. Um, it's really changing, I guess that's what I want to say. And that's a really good thing because I get excited when they're like, oh, I can just leave because I can come in and work this time and everyone supports them. And that wasn't that long ago. So we're really, really changing. And I have to, my hat's off to the millennials because I love them. And they bring that in. And they bring new ideas. Like, <laughs> and um, so I just want to say healthcare is changing. And I feel like St. Charles is really looking at that and trying to help um, create that flexibility for people because I remember people that were punished because they had a sick husband, they had a sick child, you didn't get a leave to go to a football game or you had to work. So thank you for sharing those things. Let's move on to the next question. Similar, a little different. Moving. Okay, use one or two words. This is gonna be word cloud that starts to form, and so you need to keep it short. One to two words that are most attractive working environment. It could be has chocolate. It could be um, Good anything. coffee. Yeah, good coffee. Or um, has an elephant if you work for Katie. <laughs> there you go. We don't really have elephants. <laughs> <laughs> I love these things because it, there are some definite commonalities, but it shows the diversity in, in people's own words, and I, I find these to be really fun to riff off of in a conversation. Challenging, fun, open, autonomous. I bet there's a lot of that in uh, this town because of the uh, amount of remote workforce that, that lives in Bend in Central Oregon. Humor, that's one of my favorite. Okay, Jeff, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, I'm just trying to process the words quickly here. Um, I like <laughs> this, this is fantastic. Um, can we turn the lights down just a sh shade? Uh, I especially like Nerf Wars, whoever gave us that one. That's totally My nice two team. boys, you just made their night. I will share that with them. That is amazing. <laughs> we could not do that in my office, I'm just saying, as much as I'd want to be that fun. Um, you know what, let's talk a little bit about challenging, since that's right there in the front, and I think that's really key. So. Um, one of the things that folks mentioned before, and I think this is a good keyword, I'm gonna grab it from my paper. So I heard four, th four themes come up in almost everything we've talked about tonight, okay? So I've heard that folks wanna be taken care of, right? They, they, want, they want that flexibility, they wanna be taken care of. Uh, but we're gonna jump into the work, the flexibility, the work-life harmony. I love that, by the way. I'm stealing that, absolutely stealing that. Go right that. ahead. Um, get rid of the word Oh, balance. yeah. My <laughs> office is, is getting a new word tomorrow. Uh, fulfilled, meaningful. And then uh, we also have heard and engaged. So I think challenging really kind of, I mean, it's part of all those, but I like the, I think it really fits into those last two of being, having fulfilling and meaningful work and then to be heard and engaged. So why don't, um, 
I'm going to start off with you, Jared, and I'd like you maybe talk a little bit about, in your organization, how do you engage folks in a challenging way? How do you create that work environment that's going to be meaningful, that, that they're going to feel heard, that they're going to feel engaged? Yeah, great uh, uh, question, and, and it, that term challenging, it, it, it's something we see over and over again, and, and the way that we're aspiring to do that at St. Charles is through continuous improvement of the people driving the process. Um, uh, you know, gone are the days, and, and, and there's research showing over the next five years it's really going to transition of the directing and the telling, and uh, that's the way you drive your business. People drive the business. People get those outcomes and results. They're that resource, and so opening up the door for them to uh, be empowered and, and really bring the challenge forward to themselves and as leaders asking the questions instead of looking to give the answer or know that, but you know, how could we improve upon this? And them taking that challenge and running with it and engaging with it and then seeing it and knowing that this first iteration is not the final one and keep coming back to that, uh, to engage that workforce that way. That's how we're doing it at St. Charles and, and uh, you know, seeing that blossom and getting comfortable with failure in that. So part of the challenge is knowing that uh, failure is okay, um, you know, and that's a big thing to, to say in healthcare where, you know, when we talk about that failure in the processes, obviously not with, with people's lives and, and the medical aspect, but knowing where can we fail, where is it okay to fail and experiment, and uh, realizing that uh, failure and success are interrelated in that it's trying, and we're gonna keep trying and uh, giving that opportunity to caregivers to engage that way, to look for the continuous improvement in those ideas, in those processes, and bring it forward, and then seeing it through. And if it doesn't work, knowing that we didn't stop there, let's go back and experiment some more. So, and I think you touched on something really important there <clears throat> about bringing in the talent, about asking for ideas. So I have a question of the audience. Raise your hand if you are, uh, if, if you, your company is an employer in town. Raise your hand. Excellent. Okay, now, next question. How many of you hire people because you can do all the work for your company? Right. And how many of us like to be micromanaged? How many of us really like it when somebody actually lets us use our talents and abilities to take that thing to the next step and be successful? Oh, yeah. That's a lot of good hands. So I think that's really it. So what I want to jump off that last piece on, and think about that. I, on the side, I do a lot of coaching and mentoring for folks, especially in management of teams. Um, and one of the things that I find really entertaining is that when you get into a lot of different operations and you're not managing an employee, but you're managing a team, people treat teams like suddenly it's like this new thing that they don't know how to deal with. And it's, it's an amazing thing. It's like you see the best managers turn into the unbelie most unbelievable micromanagers overnight because they're dealing with a pod instead of a, a single unit. Um, and what I have to remind them of is that they brought that team in to do a job. If they thought they could do it themselves, why did they bring that team in in the first place? And part of this I want to talk about also is success. So Katie, I'm going to talk to you for a second about this. I think this is a big one, and I want to hear your words on this. So one of the things that I think is really important about retention and about a good working environment is being able to have your employees see themselves stepping into that next level of success, that next level of professional development. And you being sort of that coach and facilitator as a hiring person or as their supervisor or boss, whatever word you like to use. So maybe talk a little bit about in your company, in terms of that challenging part, how do you sort of encourage and embrace the idea of getting people to that next level, to grow, to develop, to see themselves at that next level of the organization, whether it's in your organization or possibly another? Yeah, I think this is twofold for us. Um, our company has a little bit of a luxury that our staff is presented with challenges every day that organically come from our clients. So when they walk through the door, they're going to have emails or phone calls that is going to make every single day look a little different. So the perspective of being challenged or solving problems or that engagement for our team, uh, we have the luxury as a company that that happens organically. I don't think that we have to help create um, challenges for them to then overcome. What I think we've done a great job of and other businesses can easily replicate is our company is growing, but it doesn't always provide fast lateral growth. 
for team members. Um, and so there's ways to develop those individuals that don't necessarily involve, here's your next promotion, here's your next raise. We invest really heavily in the education of our staff. Um, we're a small company, 25 employees. We have a training process. We pay for their education through our national trade organizations. We help them get certifications. We help them obtain those things. And so as a company, we're willing to invest in their education. We're willing to invest in the furtherment of their career. Sometimes it's at a risk, you know, they could choose to leave. Um, but we do so because we believe not only does it create a better employee for our clients, but it, it creates a better people for all of us to interact with. And so I think part of that comes with challenging ourselves too, to invest, especially as a small company, it would be easy for that to be on the chopping block when, you know, taxes go up or insurance goes up or things like that and it's not it's it's a steady thing within our budget that we invest in our individuals and so I think you have to be willing to meet the employees where they're at um, which I think we've all sort of echoed um, and not just think that you create an environment that they're going to kind of continue to want to engage in they have to feel like they're moving forward Awesome. So Derek, I'm going to ask you now, there's a bunch of words that are all jumbled into that, that awesome little uh, collection right there. And what I see out of that is something about teams. And I mentioned teams in a, in a moment ago, so I want to ask you about teams. What, what is your company doing? Because I know this is key in retention. It's key for people to feel like they're a part of something, part of the community, not just the community in general of Bend, but the community of their office. And it's important for people to feel like they're a part of a team and understand the culture of the team. So I'd be really curious to hear a little bit about what uh, you all do in your organization to sort of build that team, whether it's leadership development, team development. What does that look like? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, specifically around leadership and team development, I think, I think Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go back to two of the other small words that I saw kind of uh, in the background, which kind of resonated with me. It was trust and openness. I think that one of the yeah, things that, sounds that, good. that we, uh, we do well at, at, at the site is, is to be very kind of open and frank with one another. And I think that builds trust with the team, which allows people to kind of express their opinions when they're unhappy about things and, and put forward their ideas, which I think really has gone a long way for us. Um, yeah. So... Marcus, I want to talk to you about fun. <laughs> I love fun. Um, that word is right above challenging. And one of the, so another fun thing that I get to do is um, I'm a diversity change agent and a trainer for diversity things. Um, I do quite a bit with learning disabilities, but a whole bunch of stuff in the federal government. And one of the things I get to do is generational awareness. Somebody gave a clap and a, and a highlight for the millennials and the younger generations. And one of the things that we're seeing nationwide is a cultural shift in the office place, and that is for it to be fun, right? So the Nerf gun thing, is, as wild as that is, that's probably not too far. Oh my goodness, look at that. Um, it's probably not that far off the mark, although that, I'm sure that would make a lot of us a little uncomfortable. Um, but maybe you can talk. <laughs> we got to step outside our OK zones. We're going to get there. Um, so Marcus, maybe talk to me a little bit in the conversations that you have with students or that you hear back from students. Uh, talk about the fun aspect, things that they make. And maybe not just fun, but what, what are they really looking for? What do you hear back from them when you connect with them after they've gotten into the workplace about things that they really enjoy? And what an office that is fun or enjoyable looks like to them? Well, most of them have mostly said, hey, the employer listened to me, they listened to my ideas. They understand and allow me to cultivate what I want. And then that, that's, that's great for them because most of the time no one's really listening to them. They're thinking that they're too young and no one is gonna listen to what they have to say. And then when their idea is taken into consideration and utilized, oh my God, they love it. Because they come back and they're like, oh my God, they did this today. Oh. Okay, great, that, calm down, slow it down. <laughs> but at the same time too, that lets me know that they're enthusiastic about what they're trying to do. And that person is giving them the will, hold on, the per, oh, that company is giving them the opportunity to be able to be successful, not only in their own mind, but know how they can help the community and help their business as a whole. So it's been, it's been great when they come back and tell me that. Excellent. Katie, do we want to see what some of the folks in our audience thought about some of these words? 
No, I don't. Wait, they're over there. <laughs> you had your hand up. Why don't you go ahead and hand, hand it to them? Uh, so if the vast majority of people in this room wanted flexibility and they all want to be challenged, it says to me that we uh, make people do boring tasks for too many hours of the week. So, and we've been doing, we've been on that course for decades, like work 40 hours a week, no matter if it takes you 40 hours to do your job or not, you just need to be here. So if people want to be challenged and they want to have a flexible schedule, I don't understand why we're bent on 40 hours a week or more, right? It, like, you wouldn't put challenging as your answer, which apparently most of the people in this room put, if you were fulfilled at your job. So like, as hiring employers, do you want people that are like continuing to work in environments that don't challenge them and all they want to do is get out of the office to go skiing for the day? And on the other list, it was like, people's values were lower than whether or not the job is flexible? Like, do you want to have employees that their values aren't important to them? Like, this is crazy to me. A flexible schedule and, and challenging is the two things that people of Bend that are in this room tonight want. It's like, give it to them. Cut their hours, make them do more work and less time, and give them the schedules they want. <laughs> so can I, can I speak to that one? Yes, please. So I think the big thing there is, is listening. You know, Marcus said it, and I've seen those environments, and it's listening because uh, while people want the flexibility, they still want to challenge. They want to take that project that over a three-month time span, it, it's taking more hours. But then, you know, here we are in the summer months, and hey, can I go out and do that? And listening to them and opening the door to do that. And those organizations have, uh, have been very successful. They're highly engaged, but they're also highly accountable. And they're saying, I'm willing to take that. I'm willing to own it. And, uh, and I think that comes to the fun as well. And as leaders willing to go out that norm, I have a human resources background. So people hear human resources and they're like, they're the fun police, you know, they don't allow it to happen. And that's something that, that I've challenged, you know, in this current organization and other organizations, because my team will go out and um, the work extends beyond the hours that we set, you know, the parameters go. And so on a Saturday, we're running a 10K together and we're out there doing a mud obstacle race. It's not required, but they wanna be there, they wanna be a part of it, and they wanna be challenged, um, not just within the work there, but in the relationships that they're creating, because they do spend that time and they go through that. So, you know, I look at that perspective and, it, and it's about, you know, where we're listening because it's different to each person. Some people are thinking one way of, of challenging and collaborative and fun, and some are thinking another. And that's why it's so important in these work environments to work as much as we can to tailor it for those people. Um, but knowing that engagement is a partnership and it's not just entitlement. And so that's what we're looking for is someone that, you know, for me personally, that has the values to say, I'm gonna be accountable to get it done. And I want you to empower me to do that the way that I wanna do that. And uh, it opens the door for some great uh, relationships and partnerships in the workplace. Great. Anybody else have burning desire? One more, and then um, we're, we're running a little late, so we're gonna do one quick comment, and we're gonna move on to the next question. Hi, my name's Kat. I have a, a minor pet peeve about events like this because I feel like it always speaks to a specific class of workers, one where, oh, they can come in at 10 or leave at four. And so I just wanted to speak to you briefly about the Rigid Tool Factory in Elyria, Ohio. Is anybody familiar with Rigid Tools? So they set up a piecemeal structure. So you are allowed to um, self-enroll in different trainings and become assembly members on different products. And by doing so, you can choose, do I want to build the tool where I get paid $150 to do one, or do I want to be the person that builds the tool where I get 15 cents for every accomplishment? So if you're somebody who likes to be there all day, there's something for you. If there's something that's very, very entry level or that requires modification, there's something for you. Or if you want to be the person that creates those really expensive cameras that go down the toilets to find the toothbrush, like there's something for you. So if you want to only work from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. so that you can be there for your kids, they have this great system set up so that you hit a certain threshold where you still get your benefits and so you can engage at a sense or at a level that makes sense for you. So when we talk about flexibility, I would just say as employers, please be creative in how you come up with those solutions. There are really great models that aren't in this area of how people have overcome those things. So 
keep having those conversations. Please keep letting the employees tell you what they want, how they see those solutions happening. Because um, it's, it's been really powerful in other industries, and we could do that here, too. Great input. Love this. OK, we're going to move on to the next word cloud. This one is what are we doing wrong out here? So what, what, what can you think of that is the biggest challenge, the thing that you're going, dang, I wish this would change about where I've been, about my uh, career path, and, and what fulfillment I got out of it? So this is the, the opposite side of what we were just talking about. And equally as important for employers to know what are the things, <laughs> it's funny, ch challenging, it's sometimes funny that the same word appears on both. <laughs> if you ask one side of the question and the other side of the question, it's very individual. So pay, I bet, yeah, especially in Central Oregon. Great. So I'm going to ask Jeff, it is 642. So we're going to need to speed through this one because we have one more question after this that's a broader question I wanted to end with. So over to you. Okay, so we're just going to hit this one right in the middle, pay. So pay didn't come up as one that was really high on the, the number thing that people wanted. You know, we talked about that. But maybe each of you can just sort of talk a little bit about the experiences briefly that your employees are having moving here and the challenges that they're having with the cost of living and things like that. And, and, and if, you, if any of you have experiences working outside the box to try to support that, um, helping them find housing or whatever. Maybe just share that. That'd be a good lesson learned. So we're just going to start with you, Derek, and we'll just go down the row. Yeah, certainly uh, that is a concern, particularly for our manufacturing employees. Uh, most of them, the cost of living is too high in Bend. There isn't affordable housing, and they end up living not, not as close to the site. Um, creative solutions we've had for that. I guess it's really been a, a problem that we've started encountering more recently as we've been expanding, and we haven't really come up with concrete solutions as to how to, to handle that. So I'm eager to hear of any solutions that uh, might, might be brought up. I don't have any to offer. Uh, for St. Charles, you know, we, we are a, a, a mid-sized company, and the organization has made the commitment to really, uh, one, look at uh, market, you know, not just market local, but market national, and ensure that that's being done on a consistent basis to um, be consistent in how it grows and how it grows with our local area, as well as part of the retention and retaining, because people are in healthcare getting offers in different locations all the time, um, and uh, being mindful of that, but also opening the door, again, to listen to hear what are some of the challenges uh, for those that, that haven't been able to take the role or that, you know, maybe struggling if they get in the role, how can we adjust and help and support? Um, so it's, it's ongoing dialogue uh, and um, sometimes working to be creative in that aspect. Uh, the challenging thing for me right now looking at my current job is I, the identity of the school. Like, what do you know about our school? Think about it. What do we bring to the table? That is tough. We got to figure out what our identity is. And the second thing is collaboration of industry. We don't know what you want. So how can we basically establish what classes we need to create if we don't know what you want? You want to be able to have different people to be able to come in and work for you, but if we don't know how to put them in position to be successful at your companies, we don't know. Also, think about it, collaboration of working with the educational systems other than higher ed. Guess what? There's a lot of students at the high schools in this area who would love to be working for your companies already, but if you're not interning them, how about this? Cultivate the human capital you have in your community to build what you want. We don't do a good job of it. So that being said, I've worked in high schools. I've worked at high school, a charter high school in Philadelphia. Guess what they're called? Chad, here's what they do. They take every class that they do, and it's basically built on architecture. So every class from math, science, history, English is built on architecture. By the time they graduate as seniors, every architecture firm in the country wants them. And they're all inner city kids. Kids of color. This is not just your, your typical thing anymore. So do me a big favor. Help us understand how we can help you so you can retain and keep people here so we can build the solutions to make sure they're successful while they're here. I'm going to pick on David for a second. Can you stand up, David? <laughs> so David is our intern. Uh, we participated in the Chambers um, internship program. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Plug for the Chamber. 
Um, and we love David. David, oh God, he brings ideas and this youth to a process that would otherwise, I think, take longer. But what I will say about pay is, as an employer who's a small business here in Central Oregon, it is a challenging thing for us. It is hard for us to compete with the larger employers. And so, A, we really pushed our clients. Um, we, we, we pushed our increases, and we gave that money back to our employees. Um, and collectively, over the last two years, we've seen double-digit salary increases for our staff. But that meant that somebody had to pay for it. There, there's not this endless you know, supply of income that comes into businesses. And so our end users had to pay for it. And that meant conversations with our clients about what was important and why we were increasing it. We didn't just lay a 5% increase in front of them. We explained it to them. And so I think you have to be able to tell the people that you do business with why it's important that you're doing what you're doing to keep the talent that you want. And I think the other thing that I would say about pay is to Marcus's point and um, to Jeff's point, there are really amazing talent here in Central Oregon. We work really closely with the Heart of Oregon Corps. We help cultivate their youth. There are youth out there that want jobs. They want to work for you, but they don't know how to get over those hurdles. And I believe it's our responsibility as employers to figure out how to give back. And we have found organizations that we can give back to help mentor youth, to get them into jobs, that ultimately allows us, in the beginning, to maybe pay them a little bit less, but get them where they need to go, invest in their training, and then pay them more ultimately. But it's our responsibility as employers to cultivate those programs, give back to them, and create them. So you might not be able to pay your staff what you could compete with the larger organizations, but figure out how to get there and figure out how to give back to that process. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to throw a, a thought for folks out. Just think about this for a second, and we'll, we'll jump to the next one. My office, on average, brings in about 15 people each summer for up to six months to live here temporarily in Central Oregon at, at sometimes internship level wages. We've also brought in about 25 new employees replacing positions that went vacant in the last three years. We have had only two instances that we really struggled to find housing for our employees. Our office's mentality is when we get a new employee, it is a community-wide event to find them a place to live. And we go all out. We call people. We have people staying with neighbors. We have people staying with our employees who rent rooms to them. We have people that uh, camp for part of the summer until they can find something, and we create flexible work schedules around them camping because they got to get to the showers. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, when we, we work in Prineville, and we have, an, we have people in Maupin, Grass Valley, John Day, Dayville, Prineville, and Supporting Bend. And so we have to find housing throughout Central Oregon in all places. It's a lot of word of mouth and creating that community around them when they come here. So if you think about how many people we bring in in just a summer, and we find them all housing. Right. All right, let's move on to the last question of the evening so we can give ourselves some time to unpack it. So this is a broader question. This is about Central Oregon, all employers lumped into one, and uh, considering the growth and the increasing diversity of our employers in Bend, Redmond, and other places, what are we doing to attract, or what should we do better to attract diverse, innovative and qualified folks to work for us. I love these, the little dots. <laughs> it's more fun if you do it all at the same time, so there's just a whole bunch of dots that appear. There you go. See, that's really fun. <laughs> all right. So we've, we've talked about the wages just before this, and we've talked about the housing shortage, diversity, it's got quite a few as well, but growth opportunities, great. So um, I want to pause just briefly here as we're repopulating this to tell you what the Bend Chamber actually does. So we're in the business of supporting businesses who support their people because healthy businesses mean healthy communities. So that's what we spend a lot of time doing. 
and we try and figure out from you folks as employers, what is it? What is it that you need to succeed, to grow, to be vibrant in our community? And what we have heard resoundingly in the last few years has been, we need a workforce. We need a workforce who can live here. We need them to show up, we need to keep them. So when we broke that down, not surprisingly, wages has a lot to do with it. But when you look at the outcome of the wages, it's do we have a place to live? We had our What's Brewing last month on the housing crisis and some people are trying to be creative in solving it. Child care, I know Marcus, you brought that up and Katie, you and I have talked about that a lot too and others in this room. We've got to figure out a place to, that's quality that we can leave our kids while we go to work if that's what we want to do. Um, so, so some of these things that I, I just wanted to point out that we see are populating the, the questions up here are things that we spend a lot of time on. If you can think of something else, I'm learning today, let us know so we can work with you and figure this out together. So Jeff, do you want to query our panel on some of these answers? Yeah, so I, I'm curious to get everybody's thoughts up here. So this may not relate directly to your business, but that attract more businesses with growth opportunities. That's something that I find really fascinating is how that kind of rolls into the overall economy uh, of Bend. Maybe just talk a little bit about your thoughts as the as what that relates to, um, what that looks like. Folks that are leaving your, if p folks are leaving your companies at some point, not necessarily for any other reason than they want another that next opportunity, are they able to find it here in Bend, or are they going elsewhere, or what does that look like? Maybe talk about it in those terms, and uh, we'll start with you down there, Katie. Okay. Well. <laughs> I think what I'll say from the stuff that's on the screen is that all of these things represent a community that's going through an immense amount of growing pains. Um, I am one of those rare individuals that had the opportunity to grow up in here, here in Central Oregon. Um, you know, my mom and dad graduated from Primeville. I graduated from Mountain View. My husband graduated from Bed High. So I'm one of those rare individuals that got to leave and come back and has grown up here. And all of these things represent growing pains that we're going through as a community. And you know whether it's attracting businesses that have more growth opportunities or figuring out the housing shortage or figuring out childcare, all of those things are representative of a community that people want to come to, a reason that we want to live here. But we all have a responsibility to keep it that way um, and keep it that way as it grows. And I think we have to be open as employers to attracting business to our community in the same way that we have to be open to attracting new talent and people, whether they come from California or Texas or Connecticut, we have to be open to people coming into our community and continuing to bring creative solutions. And, and me personally, and I think my business partners would attest to this, com com competition drives quality. And so don't be afraid that you know more people might come in or new businesses might come in that offer a growth pattern for your employees. Why aren't you doing that? So welcome it as an opportunity to drive what you're doing, but be welcoming. Like we are bent. This is a community we all came back to because we love it, and it's our responsibility to keep it that way. Mm -hmm. and, and to piggyback what you said, that's why we moved here because we saw that. <laughs> all right. So for us at COCC, the thing is though is wages because what happens is we get people and then we can't pay them. It's hard, it gets hard to pay people. So then we train on a lot of people with, with all the things we talked about and then they go somewhere else to another company or somewhere else. So all that talent we had left. And then also, like he says, uh, someone's talked about the um, millennial, excuse me, what generation, Carlos talked about the generation, he's a baby boomer. Guess what? A lot of those people at the school are retiring. They're retiring quickly. So what's left is you got a lot of people with a lot of openings who we can't find people to fill those spots because a lot of people are leaving and they're not, they're not going anywhere. They're staying in Central Oregon, they're retiring. So the talent's not filling the gaps. And so then we go back and go, what can we do to help try to continue to keep having people be here to be able to be successful as a college? And it goes back to what I was talking about earlier. We gotta keep cultivating the talent we have here as well to make sure that happens. And that's the hardest thing is wages for us. Yeah, I don't have a, a lot to add. I'll, I'll speak a little bit to what Katie said. I left 
a community that wasn't attracting more business with growth opportunities. I mean, literally uh, over a decade watched it start slowly, gradually shrinking and, you know, for a community starting to die. And it was because of that mindset of, you know, we don't want to grow, we don't want to be innovative, we don't want to change, we like it here, and uh, it's hurting them. Um, and, you know, saw people just like my family and I left and right that were going to communities that are looking to do that, to thrive, um, because we want to be open to those opportunities um, and, and see, like what Katie has done with her business, where people are saying, hey, we're going to be flexible, we're going to look at this and uh, just continue to make it more attractive. Um, but the partnership, and it's having discussions like this to say, you know, how can we collaborate as a community together to grow and get to where we want to be versus uh, going to why it won't work, but similar to what Katie said, why it will work and making that happen. Yeah, I think uh, one of the most important things we have to do is to keep the innovation up and, and the, uh, the businesses here. So with, with spray drying in order to solubilize chemicals for pharmaceutical application, like Bend is the hotbed. I mean, there's a little bit in Portugal, there's a little bit on the East Coast, but we've got three companies here that are all doing that, that research. And I think if we can keep building those jobs and keep innovating, then that'll allow us to be attracting the investment uh, from our clients in our services, which will allow us to, to pay our employees more and kind of make it a win-win for everybody. Thank you. So let's take it out to the audience now. I'm curious to hear from some folks out here. Um, we've talked about attracting more businesses with growth. I'd like to hear from some of the folks in the audience if you chose that, why you chose that. Uh, yeah, I, Brian Ritchie, uh, maintenance manager at Peering Management Group. Shout out, Katie. Um, all three of these things work together. When we attract more businesses with growth opportunities, that leads to increased wages. Le increased wages leads to addressing the housing, housing shortages. There's two sole source operators up here. There's not another community college in town. There's not another hospital. You set your price at whatever you want. I bet you, you guys have a great opportunity for growth because you have two competing entities in town. So it drives wages up a little bit, but it also drives people, you know, I'm a great employee. I can do better. I can go over here, right? So you get people coming from uh, different companies and coming in. We have the same thing. One of the th questions I had for you guys with the work-life balance is, do you, I, I know that's a bad term, but do you feel like that kind of, I wouldn't say kills the killers, but I was an 18-year-old kid that wouldn't let anyone tell me no. There was no one that could tell me no. I was going to work more hours than them. I was going to do that. But if I come into a company that tells me, you know, 50 hours is cool. Does that kill my small business spirit? Because Katie started a small business because she wasn't going to work that way that those people told them to. If we give those people what they want, does that kill that, I don't know, entrepreneur to it or whatever? OK, uh, Jeff, I think we have time for one more question from the audience, if anybody has a comment about this. Do we, Now's well, your time. Well, no, no, okay. Okay. Wait, wait, I wanna, can we give them an opportunity seven, to respond? It's almost seven. I know. So. Just if somebody would like to respond to the question. I don't think it kills it. Here's why. Because if a kid know, or a student knows that you basically are there for them and they're allowing them to be able to cultivate their ideas on the time that they're doing their things and they know that you got their back, hey, guess what? You got a loyal employee. So before I became an uh, educator, I worked in corporate America for about 15 years. So I did a lot of sales and marketing and, and got to work with a lot of companies. And I got to work on their uh, front end and their back end, teaching them how to run their businesses. The best employers, or when I was training, the best thing they did, I said, hey, your employees will be loyal to you if you're loyal to them. Allow them to be a part of the, not solution, be a part of the, the, the thing that you do to navigate your business. And then guess what, they'll stay. And they won't go anywhere, or they'll have their family or someone else jump into that business with them, or their friends. And they'll continue to keep doing that because they'll, they know that you got their back. But when you're continually trying to micromanage and control what they do, you lose a lot of employees that way. Let them continue to keep being using the minds that they have, and that allows them to be successful over time. Okay. Thank you. Great. Any one last question? OK. It's got to be fast because we're at 7 o'clock, but one last. So 
Um, Childcare has been one of the hot topics since I moved here a year and a half ago, and I came from a community that developed innovative solutions for that issue in particular. Our major employers took the lead on solving the problem by offering childcare to their employees and to their students. There are models at University of Washington Tacoma, Multicare General Hospital in Tacoma, and OHSU in Portland. I want to see your top employer list include pathways for helping those employers develop that resource that pulls kids out of existing childcare, freeing up spots for new and, and beautiful additions to our community. Isn't the child care, isn't there a uh, child care task force right now? Yep, in fact, we've been working a lot on that and we're working with OSU Cascades Central Oregon Community College and some of the employers here. And if you are an employer that is feeling the pinch of childcare and turnover, talk to me because we have some really cool things in the works that um, I would love to tell you all about. And thank you, Rachel, that was a great comment. I want to thank Jeff, where'd you go, Jeff? Wait, Katie needs a plug on this one yep. for a second. I'm sorry? On this childcare issue. Uh -huh. You need a plug on this because the Chamber's taken this on as a passion project because what Katie said, their job is to support businesses. This is a complicated issue. I, I have a sister that runs a business in the childcare sector, so I understand it. But Katie, you guys have an opportunity. You guys have been recognized for the work that you guys are trying to do and the solutions that you're trying to find. You guys are going to Atlanta to be a part of a conference. This is what Ben's all about. So Katie's being modest and like, Oh, if you're an employer, come and talk to me. There's really amazing things happening in this sector. <laughs> Thank you. Really. <laughs> Trying to get it done. Well, thank you. I think we could probably all stay and talk more and more about this. I really want to reach out and appreciate e each one of you who participated in this. Um, great conversation. Learned a lot. Great uh, discussion with our employers, both in the room and on the panel. I want to thank Jeff Kitchens, awesome facilitator. Thank you very much. And also Derek, Jared, Marcus, and Katie, awesome employers in our town. Really appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Thank you so much. And we'll see you in July for What's Brewing State of the County. Thanks.